we're going to look at Isaiah 52 and 53 and see how far we can go. This is the like the high point for most Christians in the book of Isaiah, because this is the passion of Jesus prophesied 600 years, 700 years before Jesus. The servant song actually starts in 52 and goes to 53. Since I don't have very many people online, I'm just using this for recording. So I'm not going to just project it, the text. I'm going to read it. And if you don't have it, if you have your phone, I also have Bibles over there. If you would like to grab one, if you'd like to follow along. But if you want to hear me, um, we're good there. Do you see them all Luther's? Anybody else want a Bible? Luther's got them over there. Uh, middle shelf, middle shelf. There's a whole right. stack of Bibles. Yeah. So the blue, the little blue ones, those are Bibles. The red ones are Bibles. Does anybody else need a Bible? Luther's got them over there if you want to follow along from that. Um, anybody else need one? Just listen. Okay. All right. So let's look at Isaiah 52. I want to spend more time in 53, but especially starting in verse 11 or 12 of 52, we get the servant song. So let's start at the beginning. Isaiah 52. Awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For there shall no more come into you the uncircumcised and the unclean. Shake yourself from the dust and arise. Be seated, O Jerusalem. Loose the bonds from your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. For thus says the Lord, you are sold for nothing, and you shall be redeemed without money. For thus says the Lord God, my people went down at the first into Egypt to sojourn there, and the Assyrian oppressed them for nothing. Now therefore what I have here, declares the Lord, seeing that my people are taken away for nothing, their rulers wail, declares the Lord, and continually all the day my name is despised. Therefore my people shall know my name. Therefore in that day they shall know that it is I who speak it, here am I. This is very cryptic, this, these first few verses, because it talks about uh, Israel and Egypt during the Exodus, right? Then it talks about Assyrian oppression, which especially happens in the northern kingdom. But by the time Isaiah writes this, the Assyrians are kind of already getting pushed away by Babylon. So it's kind of an odd passage. And then it just says, they're going to know my name. And then it says, shake the dust. And it's all about this idea of being redeemed without money. And so the idea being is that they were oppressed, basically, seemingly arbitrarily. And then they're going to be redeemed without money also. So what's going on? It's kind of an oblique passage. We get more details as it goes. Okay, so starting in verse 7, this is a very famous passage, especially verse 7. Have you ever heard this one before? How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. Have you ever heard that passage before? We often read that um, with John the Baptist, with the, um, the calling of John the Baptist. We also sometimes read this when pastors are ordained. How beautiful of those who bring good news, right? Who publishes peace, who bring good, brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. The voice of your watchmen, they lift up their voice. Together they sing for joy. For eye to eye they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you waste places of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations. And all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Then it continues, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste, and you shall not go in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. So something's going on, okay, where God's basically saying, everybody's rejoicing, somebody is bringing good news, there's a peace that's happening here. We're going to get more details with this next servant song. But the waste pieces of Jerusalem, everybody should be breaking on into singing. There's somebody with beautiful feet. The Lord has bared his holy arm. This is the idea of God's, uh, his uh, idea of strength, right? So the right arm, when you bear your arm, it's an idea of, as a king, right? Declaring authority or declaring power. <laughs> Reminds me of my students. There's an earlier passage in the Old Testament. I think I told you this before, uh, for at least some of you. <laughs> this is when they were uh, last year's class were freshmen. Uh, it says, is the Lord's arm too short? It was a rhetorical question because, you know, he reaches everywhere, right? Is the Lord's arm too short? One of my students says, no, but Mr. Hayes's are. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you for that because I do have short arms. So they, you know, high school kids, they like to do stuff like that. So that was pretty funny. <laughs> Mr. Hayes's is. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Moving on. All right. Um, so anyways, this this is introductory material. So from, from verses 1 through 12 in Isaiah 52, this is all introductory material. Something's going on that, unlike when Israel was in Egypt, or unlike when they were assessed by Assyria, uh, oppressed, sorry, by Assyria, something has changed. Um, and what's going to change? It's this servant, this servant that's coming in. Okay, so the servant song. This is the big one, and I'm just going to cut it right on the board. And I know this is pretty clear on there because I'm writing in black, and I saw that. Okay, so it's going to be Isaiah 52, starting in verse 13 through chapter 53. 
a lot of people think it's just 53, but it actually starts back here. I'll just write Isaiah like this. Okay, so here's our servant song. So we're going to get some details about how God's going to cause Zion to break into singing. It's going to be why they're singing for joy, why they're purifying themselves, why God's bearing his holy arm, why the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God. How are they going to see it? It's going to be through this servant that we see in 52, 13 through 53. In fact, and if you want the actual final verse there, just if you like, if it looks symmetrical to you, it's 53 verse 12. We'll do it that way. Okay, that's the servant song. So remember the original Hebrew and in Greek in the New Testament, there are no verses or chapter headings. So those are there for convenience, so we can make reference to them. Chapters and verses really are not a thing until the late medieval period and the early Renaissance. So think 13, 14, 1500s. Up until then, most people did not have chapters and verses. Okay, so sometimes they're, they're helpful for organization and for memorization and for reference, especially scholarship. But they also can be unhelpful because sometimes you've got to put them somewhere and it breaks up a thought, right? Or like Paul's letters. It's not like you read Paul's letters to the church in Philippi and said, okay, chapter two. <laughs> you just read the letter. Do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So sometimes we lose that in, these, in, in Isaiah. This is a great example of this, is that this servant song actually starts before 53 actually opens. Okay, so what I want to do is I got this kind of listed. We're going to read through this and kind of list some of the attributes of the servant and the details that we get. And remember, I cannot emphasize this enough. This is 600 to 700 years before Christ. And we know this is a clean prediction because we have things like the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are 150 years before the life of Jesus. We also have the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, which also dates 100 to 200 years before Jesus. So it's not like the Christians went back and doctored the manuscripts. Okay, this is a clear predictive prophecy. Okay, all right, so let's talk through this. Starting in verse 13. Behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up, and he shall be exalted. Okay, so the first thing that we get, so what's this guy going to be known for? The servant's going to have wisdom. He's going to be lifted up. Okay, and I'm going to put that in quotes because what kind of lifting are we talking about, right? Are we talking about the ascension? Are we talking about, those, are we talking about being lifted up on a cross, right? You see what I'm saying? So what is this lifted up? Because he uses lifted up. He uses the word exalted. But what kind of lifting is this? Okay, let's look at the details. It continues. So, right, behold, my servant shall act wisely. He shall be high and lifted up. He shall be exalted. As many were astonished as you, his appearance was so marred beyond, um, beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of the children of mankind. This dude doesn't, he's in rough shape. Would you agree with me on this? He's marred. Okay, so he's, he's marred. Okay, he's broken. He doesn't look well, he doesn't look un, he doesn't look healthy, right? You getting that impression? So if that's the case, what kind of exalting are we looking at here? The cross. It's the cross, right? This is not the exalting of the ascension. If he's being lifted up and he's unrecognizable and he looks marred, we're talking about the cross lifting. Okay, you, you with me on this so far? That's the context that we're getting. Okay, beyond that of the children of mankind, he, I mean, he doesn't even look like he's so beat up he doesn't even look human anymore. He's just a bloody Paul. Okay, all right. He shall, so shall he sprinkle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. So sprinkling, what is sprinkling a reference to? Blood atonement. Like the sprinkling that the priests would do of the altars, right? Sprinkling is an atonement idea. It's a purification. So I'll put that in parentheses. It's about purification. So this marred servant who's being lifted up, He's sprinkling, and notice that it's universal. It's not just for the Jews. This is for many nations. Did you catch that? So it's a pure, by being lifted up and being marred into unrecognition, he is sprinkling many nations. There's a reason why many uh, Christians, when they talk to Jews, many Jews do not know this passage in Isaiah. And so sometimes it gets called the forbidden chapter. Because, because it's so obviously fulfilled in Christ. You get what I'm saying? They have to try to explain. I'll go into some alternative interpretations, by the way. I'll show you how um, many Orthodox Jews try to get around this being about Jesus. We'll talk about that when we get there, okay? A uh, king shall not uh, shall shut their mouths because of him. So again, you get, and so what I'm going to say there, and the word I'm going to use for this, is there's something universal about this, right? Many, it says kings, not one king, but kings, plural. It says many nations. So this is a universal sprinkling, 
it's it applies to everybody you follow me on this right so there's also gentiles here okay good it's not just for the jews okay for that which has not been told them they see and that which they have not heard they understand these gentile nations don't know the law they don't have but they understand jesus See what, I'm, see, see what's being implied here? In other words, they may not get all the purification laws. They might not understand the Ten Commandments, but they look at Christ and they see salvation. So there are people that don't have the Old Testament, and they're going to know Jesus is their Savior. This this comes true, obviously, as we, as we work through. Now, the Old Testament is obviously very important because that's why we're reading it right now. But the Gentile nations are going to come to the knowledge of God through this servant. Yeah, go for it. That, that puts me in mind of blessed are the, those who... Have not seen but believe. Yeah, Jesus says that in John, right? When at, in his resurrection appearances, right? Thomas, put your put your hands here, put your hand in the side, right? And then he says, "You believe me and see," right? And then that's what he says: "Blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believe." That's exactly correct. Yep. All right. So now it goes to chapter fifty-three. So already in chapter fifty-two, we got something going on that's pretty unique in this servant. Fair enough. It continues. Who has believed what he has heard from us? In the King James, it says, "Who has believed our report." which I kind of like, it's very poetic. Our and to, message. hey, our message is what you have. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Remember, arm is about pow God's power and authority, right? There's that arm. Remember, he bared his arm earlier. Okay. So here's the arm again. So obviously, if, you, if you're using context, what arm is being mentioned is now being fulfilled in the service. That's why we know this fulfills that passage. It's a reference to the arm of the Lord again. Okay. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him. This is the servant like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground that he had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. Okay. So what does this say about Jesus's background childhood or this? We don't want to say Jesus. Let's just say the servant because at the time we're still called the suffering servant. Okay. What, what else do we want to add? What, how would you describe what we just read right there? Yeah. So he's, yeah, that's a good word. Obscure. And then, of course, another word we could use here is it's humble, it's humble beginnings, right? And what we end up finding out, he's from he's from Hicksville, right? He's from the South, right? Or he's from rural Alabama, right? Yeah. And the reason I say that to my students is they understand because then when Peter says, hey, your accent gives you away, it's because Peter don't talk so good. You know, that's the thing. I make fun of him. Actually, Peter was actually more educated than that, but I do it to make the point that they could tell he was not from around there, right? That sort of thing. So it's just when somebody from Alabama talks, you know they're from the South, it's that, kind of, that kind of thing. But again, very humble, obscure is a great example, right? Um, he didn't look like he should be king like Saul, right, in the Old Testament. The reason they chose Saul is he looked kingly. He was tall, dark, and handsome. He was a great military figure, right? He looked like an athlete. He looked like a dude people wanted to follow, right? Jesus doesn't really have that. He's just kind of an ordinary, obscure, humble carpenter is what we get later from him. Just just kind of lower middle class, right? Blue collar, right? Just normal appearance, okay? And then here we go. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Okay, so he's humble. So here's some things. He's despised. He's lonely. Notice that he's kind of abandoned in this passage. Right. They, he doesn't. He's uh, he's rejected. Yep. Forsaken. Some translations will have good. Are you getting why the uh, this is the forbidden chapter yet? You seeing this? OK, we're going to keep it's going to keep going. OK, not a scene, meaning he's dishonored is another way of saying that. OK, abandoned. We could add. But these are all things that we're getting here. OK, we have seen him not starting in verse four. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. We considered him cursed, is another way of saying that, right? We think he's cursed, okay? And then also look, in particular, this is going to be really key for us to explain why, um, and it's going to explain why there's a difference between Jews and Christians on this passage. Starting so verse 4, he has borne our griefs and carried our so sorrows. So we have this idea of suffering. And this suffering is not just to him as an individual. It's a suffering in our place. Substitution. 
substitution or sometimes called vicarious, right? He suffers vicariously. We call this the vicarious atonement or the substitutionary atonement. This is in our place. That's kind of the best way to remember this, in our place, vicarious substitution. It has something involving our griefs, our sorrows. It's in our place. Okay, we, there's a whole lot of theories on the atonement that I could get into on this, but you should know that we as Lutherans, we are definitely part of this vicarious atonement tradition. Okay, we are definitely part of the substitution model of the atonement because of passages like this. By the way, if just really, really quickly, if you don't know the other versions of the atonement, um, there's a ransom theory. Now, in the early church, it actually kind of gets off the beaten track where he actually literally pays a ransom to the devil. Okay, that's a little strange. You know what I'm saying? You kind of get what he means because we're captive, you know, in this life. But it gets a little off the track with that, okay, with the ransom theory. There's some truth in it, though, okay? Then there's the Christus Victor atonement. And we have this in our tradition also where it's he basically tramples down death by death, where it's the Jesus, the victor. He goes down and conquers everything. There's truth in that, okay? There's the substitutionary model where he literally becomes sin and he is the sacrifice, the ultimate sin and guilt offering, that's what we emphasize, okay? And most Protestants do. The other one that comes more out of liberal Christianity is the, uh, like, kind of the moral influence the uh, theory, where he's kind of like a glorified martyr. He's an example. Now, is that true? Well, yeah, to a certain extent, and we are to take up our crosses and follow him, but that's not all it is. So for very liberal Christians who kind of like say, well, the resurrection, that's that's kind of supernatural or the atonement, that's kind of bloody or it sounds like cosmic child abuse. We don't like that stuff. We'll just say he's a good example. Now, is he a good example? Yes, but it's more than that. You see how that works? So those are theories of the atonement. That's a whole subject that we could spend time on sometime. Maybe I'll do that sometime because um, that's in doctrine class. We spend time on the atonement. Yeah, go for it. Um, our Mormon brothers have that. Uh, he's a good example. Yeah, big time. Big time. Um, by the way, uh, one way to remember the atonement, and also as you spell it, is the at one mint. The at one mm -hmm. mint. Have you ever seen somebody do that before? Yeah. At one mint, meaning that at that one moment, right? At that one moment, it's one. It's a covering for all sins for all time, both directions, right? The at one mint. If that helps you, it literally means covering. Covering. Okay. Let's continue. He was wounded for our transgressions. This is super famous. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Okay, so he's suffering in our place. Okay, we already have crushed, right? We already have punished. That's what chastisement means, right? He's chastised, right? Okay, he's wounded. Scourged. Scourged, yeah, there we go. That's That uh, in particular happens in the whipping, right? With the, the cat now, the 40 minus 1, the lashes that come from the Roman soldiers, okay? Okay, and somehow... He's a healer through this. Forgive me, I'm writing low, so my, my, I'm not quite as, as even. Okay, We are healed through this. By his stripes, we are healed. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. He brings us peace. Okay, okay. So that's interesting. And that, of course, is the peace of God, right? The Pax Domini, as we say in Latin. The Pax Domini, the peace of the Lord. Okay, So that, that's actually a section of the liturgy, and we call it that, the Pax Domini. The peace of the Lord. Okay, so whenever Pastor Dinger says that, the peace of the Lord be with you always and also with you, that's the Pax Domini. And that's, we have peace with God because of this. Okay, all right. Um, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And so God's putting it on him. God is actually putting the iniquity of the world on this person, right? So this is where again, he's suffering in our place. Okay, so he's the iniquity bearer. <clears throat> which is an interesting way of saying this. But when you, you see what I'm saying? He's the bearer of our iniquities. How does Paul say this in Corinthians? For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. He becomes sin. Think about what that actually means. The creator of the universe actually becomes sin. Or as it says in here, the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. By the way, I cannot read this without thinking of Handel's Messiah. Because there's this one, it's hilarious. If you know musical word painting, it actually makes, if you, the more you study music, it's funny and it's supposed to be. So it's all we like sheep and it sounds like stupid sheep. So it's all we like sheep. And then the music goes astray. Has gone astray. It just jumps all over the place because it's astray. And then we have turned everyone to his own way and the music starts turning. 
we have turned. They're doing this. The sheep are turning in circles. It's all word painting. And then the music just stops. And then the whole music lowers. And the Lord has laid on him, has laid on him. And it gets really dark and quiet because the sins of the world are laid on him musically. Wonderful moment, Messiah. And, and so it's hard for me to read this and not think of that because it's so effective word painting. Um, as laid on him, the iniquity of us all. And it's just quiet and dark. And so it starts off kind of stupid and dumb and hilarious because it's our condition. And then, boom, the rug just takes taken out from under you. He plays this musical trick on you. It's a wonderful moment, Messiah. Um, he's laid on us, the iniquity of us all. Brilliant. I show it to all my kids, and they're very quiet. Because it's even now, you know, 200, 300 years later, it's still very effective illustrating um, this text so well. Okay. He was oppressed. Okay. There's another one. That's the next verse. Okay. He's oppressed. He's afflicted. Continues, okay. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened out not his mouth. Okay, there we go. So now we get the silence where he's at his trial and he doesn't talk, right? We're going to get that prophecy now. He was silenced like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silent. He opened not his mouth. We get the lamb idea now. He's, of course, we're, John's going to say he's the lamb of God, right? He's a lamb, okay. Um, by oppression and judgment, he is judged, okay? Unjustly, but in our place, justly, right? Because it's our sins placed upon him in our place. He is judged, okay? By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And for his generation, who consider that he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, okay? He dies. Think about it. Think what it says. He was cut off from the land of the living, it continues, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. How is he buried? Joseph Arimathea, wealthy guy, has a newly cut tomb. Nobody's ever been buried there. He's buried with the rich. Okay. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, he dies, yet he is still innocent. He's innocent of all this. He's afflicted. He's oppressed. He bears our iniquities. He's silent. He's a lamb. He's scourged. He's wounded. And he is still innocent. Okay. Key for us here. Okay. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. And he was put into grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt. Now this is key for us. Look at what happens here. There's a shift starting in verse 10. So the will, this the will of the Lord to crush him. So in other words, he fulfills. This is, this is right. This is the will of God. Okay, it was the will of God to crush him, and he was put to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, this is back all the way to the sprinkling idea, right? The idea of an offering and a purification, but he is a guilt offering. This is something that we see in the uh, Old Testament. It's part of the sacrificial system. He is a guilt offering. Now we have a shift. Look in verse 10. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. But wait, he was cut off from the land of the living. How is he seeing this? See what this is? Here's the resurrection. Here we have it right here, right? So we have the resurrection. Okay. We have a resurrection prophecy. It continues. Look what happens. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous. And he shall bear their iniquities. So through this servant... We shall become righteous. Okay. This is why we say we are in Christ, right? Our identity is in Christ. It's his righteousness. So he is righteous. Okay. There's so much theology in this. I mean, th think about how this is the gospel in just a few verses, right? Because now this righteous servant, so not only does he become our iniquity, because he is our iniquity bearer, we are now righteous through him. It's a great exchange. He takes our sins, and then he gives us his righteousness. This is the great exchange. This is what we call in theology. This is the great exchange. Okay, He shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death. Now we have the idea of a drink offering, that pouring, like libation, right? A drink offering. He shall divide the spoil because he was poured out his soul to death, and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. What is an intercessor? Who, what, who does the intercession in the Old Testament? 
God does, but who, who, what, who, what role, what office is the intercessory office? Who makes intercession on behalf of the people? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does now. Priest. Priest. Yes. He's a priest. See? Priestly office. What's he doing right now in heaven? He's the high priest. Okay, so we have the resurrection. We have his righteousness, and now he's interceding for his people. On the, see, see what I'm saying? Okay, so this is the ascension, and we call this the session of Jesus. So he ascends, Acts 1, right? Go into all the world, preach the gospel, and then he ascends, and then it quotes Psalm 110 everywhere throughout the New Testament. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Right, It's quoted numerous times throughout the New Testament. So he sits at the right hand of power. Okay, He's sitting there, and as he sits there, he now makes intercession. He bears the scars right, of his crucifixion, of his atonement, of his passion, of this thing that he did. And now he what? He intercedes on behalf of the people. Okay. Brilliant. This is, this, I mean, this is, I mean, so this is, again, remember, I remind you, this is six to 700 years before Jesus is even on this earth. What do you do with this? You know what I mean? Yeah, go for it. Go ahead. I was just going to say that it's, it's like the Mormons use the, um, the Mel priesthood of Melchizedek as oh, one yeah. of their things. But Melchizedek was only mentioned a couple of times in the Bible because he was a type. He was a prophet, priest, and king. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is prophet, priest, and king. It's a fascinating passage to Melchizedek because it's mentioned in Psalm 110, right? So that same passage, this is good. In, in case you didn't know this, this is going to show you. It can, this is where all scripture interprets scripture. It's one story. You can't like take one part out and you know discard the rest, right? It's one story. So we say that Jesus has that threefold office, prophet, priest, and king. Okay, we definitely see the priest here. Okay, that's the in particular, and he's both the sacrifice and the priest, right? He's both the sacrifice and the one who does it. Okay, but anyways, in um, Psalm 110, if you haven't seen that, I recommend, I don't have time to go through that whole psalm with you today, but it's the Ascension Day Psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. Jesus says that himself. He says it to the priest to confound him. He's like, when David says that, how does he offer, how is it that he calls him Lord? And they have no way of answering Jesus. He confounds them with this psalm. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand. And then later on in that same psalm, it says, you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Okay, right? Melchizedek's a mysterious figure. Abraham pays him a tithe of 10% um, after Abraham gets the spoils of war. And he's the priest of, Sa priest of Salem. Salem means peace, like Salam or Shalom. So the prince of peace comes out to Abraham and Abraham pays him a tithe. He is the priest king of Salem. The prince, priest, I mean, you see what's going on here? This is in Genesis. This is way back. Okay. In fact, that actually might be Jerusalem. The prince of Salem might actually be an early version of Jerusalem because it's on a temple mount. It's in the right area. Okay. It might actually be Jerusalem. Preach as well. Could be. Okay. And so there's a couple of options here. Is this the actual priest king or is it a pre-incarnate Christ? Some people will actually say this is a Christophany in the Old Testament, that it's Jesus showing up before he takes on flesh, kind of like the fourth man in the burning furnace or uh, the night, the visitors of Abraham. Right. Your your son, your wife's going to have a have a baby. And then Sarah laughs and God knows that Sarah laughs. Is that God the father? Or is that God the son that appears to Abraham? Think about it. You see what I'm saying? So maybe Melchizedek is a pre-incarnate Christ. But even if it's just an individual, he's the priest of the high God. Remember, this is before there's such a thing as the nation of Israel yet. So one of the reasons that he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek is his priesthood is superior to the Aaronic priesthood because the Aaronic priesthood is set up later. And so we have Melchizedek hundreds of years before we have Aaron and Moses, and Jesus is a priest after that. So it's a superior priesthood to the Levitical priesthood. Okay, makes sense. See where this is coming. And he makes this atonement for the sins of the people. Okay, so he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. You can definitely make that connection at the end of this passage. Yeah, we're going to say. The question was, was it Jesus who appeared in the form of God? Well, in essence, it was both. Yeah, that is both. They that is because he's fully God. Right. And revealed by the Holy Spirit. This is where we have a hard time talking about the Trinity, right? Because right. that gets us into trouble because we're trying to put in human terms or in our English language the mystery of the Holy Trinity. And we can, and all of us, every single Christian, and I've studied theology, I got a master's degree in theology, and I still sometimes say things that are borderline heretical on accident. Because, you know, because it's so hard to speak correctly about this, because you can either divide the persons up too much, so you have like tritheism, which is what, the, which is what our LDS neighbors do, is they have tritheism. They have, a, they have three different beings that are united in purpose. So the version of Holy Trinity in Mormonism is really tritheism. 
And really, if you think about it, since every single human being is the same species of God, they're really just polytheists. They have millions of little gods, right? Because you can you can evolve, right? We call that eternal progression. So really, you have you have it's really polytheistic, but functionally kind of monotheistic because we're not worried about the gods in the other worlds. We're only worried about this one is what you is what you'll hear. And so I'm like, yeah, but ontologically, you're still polytheistic because you believe it's at least possible to have multiple gods. We don't believe that. We believe there's one God and there can be no other. He is the supreme, ultimate, no greater being that can be conceived, right? That sort of thing. That's one of our big fundamental things. But yeah, I make those mistakes all the time. So you can either divide the persons too much and you end up with tritheism, or you can remove the distinctions. And then you have a heresy called modalism, where God just kind of appears as different modes. So it's not God the Father. It's God as the Father. It's God as the Son. Now we've got another problem. Because you've, you, when you remove the distinctions, now you've got Jesus praying to himself in the garden. You see what I'm saying? Or on Jesus' baptism, when the Father speaks and the, and the Spirit descends as a dove, and you're like, oh, that's just God talking to himself? Like, how does that work? You know what I'm saying? When Jesus says, I'm going to go away and send you the Holy Spirit, it's almost like he comes back in disguise, in modalism. All right, I'm going to go, and then the Spirit's going to come to you, but that's really just me in disguise in a different form. That's modalism. Does that make sense? You see why that's a problem? So we, ha we have to avoid two ends of the stick, where we divide the persons up so much that we have three gods, and the other where there's no distinction in persons at all, which is why we're so careful to say one God in three persons or one substance and three subsistences. It's a lot of S's. It's a good tongue twister or one essence and three subsistences. You see what I'm saying? That's why we say those words like consubstantial with the father or of one substance with the father in, our, in the Nicene Creed. We're trying so hard. To, and it's not like we're defining God. We're just setting the boundaries. Say, hey, somewhere within this boundary is how we talk about our experience and what we see in in, in the scriptures and in the history of the church. Anyways, this is this is incredible. If you actually look at this, like, like all these attributes, the things that we're seeing in Isaiah 52 and 53, you look at this and as Christians, we're like, how can you not see this? You know what I'm saying? I mean, this is so patently obvious that this is about Jesus. Here's what our uh, Jewish friends will say about this. So again, this is sometimes called the forbidden chapter. You can actually Google, I, I mean, not Google, YouTube, Isaiah 53 and it'll say the forbidden chapter. And because it, it's about Christians trying to reach Jews. So I don't know if you know this. Michael Brown, who is a Jewish Christian uh, uh, believer, who uh, he was called Iron Man because he did so many drugs in high school. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Michael Brown. So, I mean, he has an amazing testimony. And he went to church because he was in love with one of the girls. Like, I mean, this is a dude that should not. So he's Jewish. Okay. He's a drug abuser. And he goes to church just because he thinks one of the, one of the girls is hot, basically. That's why he goes. And now he's an apologist trying to reach Jews for Christ. He, amazing conversion story. Okay. He talks about this chapter. I do this book with my high school kids. I'm going to get this out of my, uh, and I'll show it up to the camera too for in case some people are watching the recording. Just going to be in here. I do this book. It may be worth doing it in my class sometimes. It's called The Case for the Real Jesus, Lee Strobel. He goes around and interviews people. One of his interviews is with Michael Brown. And so I want to give you this. I'm going to end on this, and we can talk more about this. Let's see where we at. Oh, here it is. So Jewish, Jewish authorities will often say something along this line. It's Jesus was an imposter who failed to fulfill the prophecies about Messiah. When they get to this chapter, do you want to know how most Jews understand this chapter? It's about Israel, Israel as a corporate body. That it's not about a single suffering servant. It's about the nation of Israel. As the stuff, in other words, it's personified as a person, and there's actually truth in that because we actually do believe also that Jesus personifies Israel in his person. Like when he goes out into the desert, it's reduced to one. He does what Israel could not do, right? So we actually agree in a weird way with that. But what they say is this is the nation of Israel, and so because the nation of Israel has gone through things like the Holocaust, or because the nation of Israel has been, uh, you know, exiled and brought back. And, you know, been unjustly abused and punished and stuff like that, that the nation of Israel is this. Do you see how they get around this? That's that's the usual objection you're going to hear. So here. So Michael Brown. So listen to this. I'm just going to I'm going to give you his uh, his uh, his highlight right here. Here we go. As a teenager growing up on Long Island, Michael Brown's insatiable appetite for illicit drugs earned him the nicknames Iron Man and Drug Bear. By the age of 15, the aspiring rock and roll drummer was shooting heroin and burglarizing homes and even a doctor's office for amusement. He was the son of a senior lawyer for the New York Supreme Court. He grew up in a Jewish family, but was uninterested in spiritual matters. When he was bar mitzvahed at the age of 13, 
he was giving a Hebrew passage to memorize, but nobody ever translated it for him, and he never bothered to ask anyone what the words meant. The hymn was a meaningless ritual. In 1971, the two members of Brown's band began attending the local church because they were in pursuit of the two girls who were related to the pastor. But little by little, the gospel began to influence them. Upset by the changes in their lives, Brown decided to visit the church in an effort to extricate them. One of the girls, aware of his reputation, wrote in her diary that night, Antichrist comes to church. <laughs> Unexpectedly, in the months that followed, Brown began discovering a new emotion, a gnawing sense of regret and conviction over his rebellious, drug-saturated behavior. He ended up in many discussions with Christians about spirituality. Then on November 12, 1971, the pastor asked if anyone wanted to have a confrontation or a, or a relationship with Christ. Brown walked down the aisle, not because he wanted to become a Christian, but so he could give the congregation a thrill. <laughs> After all, he was sure they regarded him as the worst of sinners. Then something even more unexpected happened. As he repeated the words of the pastor in repentance and faith, he found himself suddenly believing the message of Christ. It was like a light went on, he said. Instantly, he believed that Jesus had died for his sins and risen from the dead. Now, think about this. Now, what we know as Lutherans, by the way, is that's the Holy Spirit doing something to him. Because notice he did not go down wanting to convert. All of a sudden, it just clicks. It's because the Holy Spirit's doing something to him. Remember this passage. This is going to happen. Right? It's universal. People that don't even understand are all of a sudden just going to, you know what I mean? God's going to do a work in them. This is coming true in his life. He's a walking example of the early part of this passage. Okay? It continues. Um, he says, now that uh, it was like a light went on. I knew Jesus had died and risen from the dead. I knew it was real. Now the challenge was, what am I going to do with it? Because I wasn't ready to change my lifestyle. It wasn't until five weeks later that he permanently abandoned his drugs and yielded his life. And a lot of us, because a lot of us like to think there's this dramatic conversion, it's pretty gradual for some people. It took him five weeks to figure this out, even to even start decide to give some of his life up. Something was going on in his life. Okay, now his father liked the improvement in his behavior. Remember, this is a lawyer for the Supreme Court, but he didn't like the Jesus part. He took his son to the local rabbi and eventually took him to the ultra-Orthodox Jews in, uh, in Brooklyn. These are like the Hasidic Jews, the ones that have the curls on their heads, right, that always wear black, okay? None of them was able to dislodge his beef, belief, now confirmed by his deep study, go ahead and sit here, guys, that's fine, thank you, um, that Jesus was the Messiah of Israel. So then he goes, gets a degree in Near Eastern languages and literatures, and comes a scholar of Hebrew. Okay, after all this, it's an amazing story. This is incredible. So guess what happens when he gets to Isaiah 53? Okay, so I'm going to go on this. The suffering servant, he quotes this, okay? <laughs> this is what he says, so you know his life story. Some commentators, I pointed out, say this description of the suffering servant applies to the people of Israel as a nation, not an individual who is the Messiah. Doesn't the passage actually deal with the return of the Jewish people from Babylon, which occurred more than 500 years? That's the backdrop of many of the messianic prophecies, Brown said. But nowhere in the classical, foundational, authoritative Jewish writings do we find the interpretation that this passage refers to the nation of Israel. References to the servant as a people actually end with Isaiah 48, 20. Many traditional Jewish interpreters from the Targum to today had no problem seeing this passage referring to the Messiah. By the 16th century, Rabbi Moshe Alshek said, our rabbis with one voice accept and affirm the opinion that the prophet is speaking of the Messiah, and we shall ourselves adhere to the same view. So he was saying that all his contemporaries agree with the messianic reading, even though it must have been very tempting to deny this, because by that time Christians had been claiming for centuries that this passage describes Yeshua, Jesus, right? So here's Michael Brown saying that this is not just Israel, right? And he talks and he goes through it. So this is an interesting, we can continue this because we're past uh, 45 and my kids are up here. But even the Jewish authorities up until the 1600s, so this is 1600 years after Jesus, the majority of them viewed this as a prophecy of Messiah. So now you got yourself a problem because this is so blatantly, obviously fulfilled in Christ. If you believe that the, the gospels or you believe the historical documents about Jesus, now you got a problem. But this passage is the single most passage in the Old Testament that leads Jewish people to Christ. This is it. That's fine. Just sit down. That's fine. I don't need it. It's just, it's just audio. All right. So anyways, with that in mind, he's worried about being my technical advisor. Okay. Yes. So okay. he's, 
he, he doesn't know it yet, but he's already programmed to be a teacher, even though he doesn't know it yet. So, all right. Uh, any, well, I just told him, so I do know it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> all right. So anyways, my kids just joined me because their Sunday school ended, and we need to end in case people need to go to worship at this later service. Any comments or questions on this? Is this helpful just to kind of do this macro view? I'm fascinated to see how Pastor Dinger did this and see how similar it is and how different it is because we have just different approaches. It'll be – I'm going to listen to it later and just see what happens on the podcast. It'll be kind of fun. So um, hopefully this is meaningful for you. Um, let's close with the blessing. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. The Lord lift up his countenance upon us and give us peace. Amen.